go ahead and let them have it. Oh yeah, we should do put loops. Everyone up.
Um, I, I want you to know that you can play a big role in this campaign on restoring your voice and this region's voice. Uh, another seminal failure is, uh, is my opponent on agriculture. I know more of your family's involved in agriculture, finance too. You know, my opponent promised that he would open up trade and foreign markets for our agriculture products. It's one of the few things we do in this community still is we grow grapes and cherries, and yet he voted against free trade for our agriculture products. That's a slap in the face to this entire community. I think the seminal failure, though, was redistricting. You know, um, long before you guys were born, long before I was born, there were a lot of people in California who were upset with the way redistricting was done. This is the process every 10 years where we get new congressional districts. Well, instead of the state legislature doing it, you had politicians drawing their own lines, the people of California got fed up and they said, well, we want citizens drawing congressional districts, not politicians drawing their own lines. Right? It makes sense. The process was supposed to be apolitical. And yet my opponent, who doesn't even live in this district, paid a lobbyist $20,000 to undermine the redistricting commission. I mean, that's how we have been taken for granted, abused, and neglected, and forgotten in this community. And I'm a young guy. I'm actually turning 25 this year. You all have probably read the Constitution. That is the age limit to be in the House of Representatives, so we're pushing the age envelope. But I tell you, I, I think we in this community really need to stand together. Right now, you have no elected representatives in Congress who are actually from this community, and that's a shame. Think about it. The president just gave a state of the union. There was no one there in that rotunda who lived like you do. And that, that, to me, is something that calls out for a change. But I think politics as a whole kind of needs a facelift, if you will. And I'll tell you what is special about this campaign. You're not just restoring this region's voice in politics, but you know we can be a part of something better. Um, think about the out-of-control debt. That's going to affect you and your kids, generations to come, taxpayers who aren't even born yet. This campaign can be the campaign that actually talks about public education in a serious way. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I served on the State Board of Education. I'll never forget, seven years ago, I was you know, a young and skinny guy, and Arnold Schwarzenegger called me up and said, Ricky, you know what? I want to appoint you to the State Board of Education. I think you can make a difference for the seven million public school students in the state. And I fought for the high school exit exam. We fought for more charter schools and competition in public education. That's something this campaign's about. You know, the Bay Area has a lot of charter school philanthropy and activity. We almost have none of it in this community. And we're, you know, I know UOP is a little bit of an oasis. It's a beautiful campus here. But just two or three miles from here, there's a high school dropout crisis happening. This campaign can be the campaign that talks about it. How about Silicon Valley and the Central Valley? You know, I'm from the Central Valley. I love this community. But the one industry we have that I told you McNerney's neglected is agriculture. Well, we need to diversify this economy. We need new industries here. We need some high-tech investment. And and I think we're going to need new leadership to get that. This can be the campaign that builds a bridge between Silicon Valley and the Central Valley. That's an investment we can all be proud of. You know, this can be the campaign that talks about making sure we don't have red tape and rules and regulations that are getting in the way of the American entrepreneur. You know, this can be the campaign that talks about a patriotic energy policy. Here's what I mean by that. You know, when Canada comes to us and says, we want you to build a pipeline to take our oil, now, we shouldn't say no to that. We should say yes to that. That's, that's economic activity for us. So these are all disagreements I have with my opponent, but they're also opportunities for this community. And, uh, and I will tell you, I, uh, I have a tough time forgetting when we announced this campaign. So I uh, actually announced at Lodi Memorial Hospital, which is where I was born. I uh, actually had a nurse there who was there when I was born who actually would support me. It was a special moment. But the weather was bad. And the reason I tell you this is that you know, I've never seen a May wind and rainstorm like we had that day. But it, fortunately, was not an omen for the, how this campaign was going to turn out. Because things have gone impressively well. Uh, I'll tell you, in, in November, we had a sitting governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, who flew all the way across the country to campaign for us in Stockton. Uh, we just had the former governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, fly across the country to campaign for us. We have this thing within striking distance. But I need your help. You know, I, I often kid that, and a lot of people will say, age is nothing but a number. And if there's a unifying theme in this campaign, that's, that's probably it. Whether you're young or old, age is nothing but a number. You can make a difference. Uh, no one should tell you no. When I was on the State Board of Education, we fought for more student board members around the state on local school boards, right? I think students should be the consumers of education. They should be the ones uh, with a real seat at the table. Every other interest group has a seat at the table, so should students. Um, 
I do believe that uh, there have been times in my life when, probably like you, people have said, well, you're pushing the age envelope too far. And we resisted that. You know, fought for the high school exit exam. I'll, I'll give you another example. I uh, was proud of the work I did for the Oakland Athletics. Before you judge me, I am a Giants fan, but I did that. I worked with the Oakland A's, and we helped limit the liability exposure that that baseball team had. Um, and I did all this stuff at a young age, but I think it all points to a very important message, which is that you can make a difference. And in this campaign, where no one cares about us politically, you can make a difference. Uh, I'd ask you for a couple of things. Uh, you might not have deep pockets, so you can't contribute to me, but you can give me your energy. You can give me your best wishes and your effort. Uh, we're giving it all I've got. I don't have white hair on my head now, but I will at the end of this race. Some of you might too if you join me, but it'll be worth it. So here's what you can do. Colin's our communications director, but Buck Cram, who I'd like you to welcome. He's not a California. He's from Virginia. Buck is my campaign manager. Get involved. Buck's got a simple email address. It's buck at rickygill.com. We've got volunteer forms. We'd love to have your help. We're thinking about, we've got several offices that are in queue, but we'd like to open up one here on Pacific Avenue. We'd love to have your help. Because my opponent's not from here, and his volunteers don't even come from here. So this is an opportunity for us to say no to that. Um, get involved. If you're on Twitter, tweet about us today. Say, hey, I saw our handle is for Ricky Gill. It's the number four Ricky Gill. Just say, hey, I saw Ricky Gill. Uh, don't tell him I'm a bad guy, but tweet something nice. Get on Facebook, but please volunteer. That's the one thing you can do for us. Because I will say, uh, in this generation, we are the young people bearing the burden of this debt. But we also have the power of possibility. And if we don't step up for this community now, we're going to get walked over by my opponent who's using us as a means to an end. I told you about the manipulation of redistricting. We just have to, we have to be better than this. You know, We just cannot be taken for granted. Uh, and you can be on the front line of that fight, but this is the campaign to do it. So I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thanks so much. See Buck Cram. I need your help, and uh, good to be with Tigers. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Happy to take questions if you want. I think we got some time to. Uh, I know you don't want to cut class. So you got to pull out. <laughs> yeah. Go when you mentioned the Keystone Oil Pipeline, yep. I'm just curious. Do you know what? Um, McNerney cited as his uh, issue against it? Well, you know, what happened was the White House pulled the plug, and so as a consequence, he was kind of given a free pass. But, you know, in, in fact, it, uh, the opposition was there. And it wasn't on paper because the, the White House pulled the plug before Congress had to vote. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Okay, I have a, a question about the issue of free trade in, in relation to, to agriculture. Was this an issue of protective tariffs or, or, or trade embargoes or, or, or what, would, what were the specifics? I also have another question, but, but first I would. We'll start with that one. Um, you know, the California Farm Bureau, a whole host of agriculture interests, and I told you this is an interest that we have to protect. Is our, you know, that's an industry that we've got to be proud of. Um, they all rally around these free trade agreements because they would boost exports of walnuts, uh, pistachios, raisins, almonds, uh, you name it. Uh, in fact, there was uh, there are articles in the San Francisco Chronicle to corroborate this. Uh, what's interesting about this issue, by the way, is that President Obama and House Republicans actually agreed this was a good thing. I mean, Barack Obama and Republican members of Congress got together and said, yeah, we should pass these agreements. They make sense for a lot of industries, including agriculture. And yet my opponent voted against them. And, and what I find odd is, who's one of the very few, if not the only member of Congress from a rural district, because that's admittedly what we are, kind of a rural district, to vote against these free trade agreements. So it's pretty much a consensus they would have been good. They would have brought down protective tariffs in South Korea, Colombia, and Panama on a variety of fruits and nuts. That's the specific. Uh, and what was this specific, what was the specific name of this free trade agreement that you voted against? Well, they were with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. Um, what was it called? Because they, they really have some name like NAFTA, CAFTA. Uh, well, it was a yeah. core U.S. I think that was the acronym for the Korea-U.S. agreement. I can get those. Okay. My other question, you mentioned building a, a bridge in, in, in this area. Do you, mean, do you mean by private contractors or, or, or the government? No, I was talking about that. Sorry if you misconstrued that. I was talking about a figurative bridge between Silicon Valley and the Central Valley. So 
My only point is we have, if you look at, uh, here's an interesting statistic. <coughs> From the day Ronald Reagan became president to today, so think about that, that's 32 years. <coughs> all net job creation in America is attributable to companies in their infancy, these high growth startup companies. And we actually, in this community, one of the statements on our economy is that we have none of that activity really happening here, not enough at least. So um, in Silicon Valley, they certainly have this activity. I'd like to see more collaboration between the Central Valley and the, and the Silicon Valley. That was not a physical bridge, that was a figurative bridge. Um, but for that to happen, we gotta improve our school system, right? It all comes back to education. And we need to have the human capital to support those businesses. Again, my complaint against my opponent is on an issue like education or even this economic development. It's not voting a certain way, but it's leading. You know, it's talking about the issue. It's about coming to UOP and using this institution in a way that's positive. He just hasn't used the bully pulpit of his office to, to do what's right. And we gotta raise the volume on these things. Yeah. Right here. The job growth in the uh, tech industry. Uh, did you position on SOPA and HIPAA? Yeah. Uh, to share the yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I'm still kind of working through and I'm working through uh, with my team. But I, as at first glance, at first blush, I'm against SOPA. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, we need fewer, not more barriers to the diffusion of information. But that's an initial problem. Yeah, go ahead. So, we criticize Kate Mary in a lot of uh, the congressional district right now because we're not being represented, right, in this community. Stockton particularly, right? In the new district, yeah. Yeah, uh, mainly Stockton, right? Largely Stockton. I'll tell you, Stockton got carved up in the last district. Yeah. But a lot of your experiences and a lot of like what you've done have been in Lodi. How are you going to make anything different in Stockton particularly, which means it when there's a big disparity between the demographics of Lodi and Stockton? Well, actually, um, I will tell you a lot of my experience have been in Stockton. You know, I was involved with St. Mary's Interfaith, which, as you know, is under Highway 4 uh, near the Crosstown. Uh, these are good folks from the front lines of fighting poverty in our community. That was actually my first real volunteer experience in the entire county was in Stockton. So, um, look, there's a lot that we need to do. I'll tell you a conversation I just had with a guy who's becoming a friend of my campaigns, and you might think we're not two peas of the same pod, is Nick Diaz. I don't know if you know who Nick is. Nick's a UFC fighter, and he's from Stockton. We actually went to Toke at different times. And we, uh, Nick's a good guy, and, and we sat down over lunch, and he said, you know what, Ricky, I'm fighting for Stockton. Uh, and in fact, Nick's a guy who's from Stockton, his gym is in Lodi. These communities have a lot more in common than meets the eye. But he said, you know, I'm fighting for Stockton in the Polygon. I think you're fighting for Stockton in a, in a political arena. And uh, so we're actually working on a few community initiatives. One of them is around a fight for Stockton type theme, where we're going to talk about the high school dropout crisis, literacy initiatives for young people. In fact, your school of education does a commendable job on literacy and bringing awareness to that issue. So there's a lot of collaboration that I foresee happening, and Stockton is going to be at the heart. And also, I had a, a curious question. Uh, I read a, a paper right there. You said that uh, your parents were uh, immigrants from India and Uganda. How do you stand on immigrant policies? Well, a, interesting uh, question. Our immigration policy in this country is broken. Uh, my mother and father have a, an interesting journey. It's, I kind of say my father hopscotched a lot of continents to be here. He spent the majority of his life now in the San Joaquin Valley, but they're born in India. My father grew up in Africa, in Uganda. And uh, one of the reasons we got involved as a family in agriculture is because that was my father's first ambition, was to be a farmer. Loved the tea farms of Tanzania and Uganda. <coughs> Anyways, the, the rest is, is his history. But one part of our immigration policy that's broken that no politicians want to talk about is skilled immigration. We, uh, I told you about how we need more high growth startup activity here. Well, one, one problem is we have so many high skilled immigrants who come to great universities, um, you know, you name it, they're on the West Coast, whether it's uh, places like UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford, there are wonderful universities getting graduate degrees. And then we make it very tough for these people to stay in this country afterwards. So there are things we can do. I think if you get a science or technology graduate degree, maybe a PhD or a master's degree and above, uh, we should make it easier for these people to stay here. So that's an example of a broken immigration policy. Yeah. Being from Stockton, having parents who are immigrants, 
are they not as equal to have residency in here being farmers and working in this agriculture that you're so trying to broaden like to trade and stuff do they not have the same opportunities as those who have a phd and above well so i'm not sure i actually understand your question entirely Can you like out? those um immigrants who come who are who come to Stockton, mainly the Central Valley, to work in the agriculture, do they not have the same rights or the same privileges as having getting residency in the United States for not having a PhD or like it's only for the people who are no, when, who are educated or I think we need a, a policy that makes sense even for agriculture industry too. I think we really do. But but right now I think we can all admit kind of we have a haphazard situation, you know, where you know we're not sure exactly who's coming in or, or what jobs exist. There's just a mismatch. And that to me is, um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of unregulated and chaotic. It's not fair to the worker. It's not fair to the employer who's trying to get a vacancy filled. So the problem is the federal government's done nothing on the issue. And just letting the problem continue isn't an answer. So I think I agree. Think you're up with your code, aren't you? <laughs> Anyone else first? Is there someone else? Yeah, Professor. What can you do or what could you propose in Congress to help <coughs> you get, I mean, you know, we, we were labeled, uh, you know, foreclosure capital yeah. in the United States. Okay. And it seems like, you know, the construction industry was really a major economic engine for the whole valley, you yeah. know, no question about it, yeah. throughout California. I mean, there's something, I mean, there's such a large backlog of inventory that people are saying, we're not going to come out of this for you know, another five years. I mean, is there anything different I think you could propose in Congress to help stimulate, you know, or kind of rework the situation or help go on a little faster? There are a couple of things I think we can do. Some people may say this is working on the margins, but um, the first thing is uh, if there are transfers made in the housing market, um, to facilitate the sort of continued uh, flow I think we should have, I mean, you can reduce taxes on these, on the sale profits or on, on sales to fray those tax expenditures. Um, the other thing, I mean, there are, some people talk about principal reduction programs, but that's politically pretty tough to do. Um, so, you know, making sure that refinance, we need to be able to refinance uh, more people in this community, especially with lower interest rates. The problem is banks are very cautious to do that. So if we can, if we can create a policy where it's easier for banks to refi and where maybe their, their risk appetite is not offended so much, that's what we need to be doing. Um, obviously, you know, contracts are the basis of our economic system, so we can't trample too heavily on that, but, but I think we need an answer on this foreclosure issue. And, uh, I, I saw an interesting program actually in East Contra Costa County where there are people who have been evicted, who have been readmitted to their homes, um, and are paying more of a rental fee as opposed to a mortgage payment, and then eventually they can graduate to home ownership. Now the issue with these programs is can they be scaled out uh, across the entire housing market? And th these are all things we need to look at, but I was very interested in this program mm -hmm. in these kind of <coughs> because if you can't own your home, maybe we keep you in your home, but you're paying a rental payment. Um, but someone else has to be the backstop for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a well with you. Uh, Morgan and Ashley know me only too well. Um, I'm pretty much their uh, own voice in class all the time. I'm a dimable liberal Democrat, and I gotta say, you're selling me really well right now. Um, you're talking about education policy, and um, I'm not hearing the usual uh, Republican Party line, which I absolutely love, but uh, my, my question is, um, in terms of education, where do you stand with uh, where the president has been taking um, federal, uh, the federal, where, where do you see it as positive or negative, the, the role the president's having federal take in uh, education for district to district, and uh, what's your position for bilingual uh, education, particularly for uh, Latinos? Great questions. Um, look, there's a split, I think, in the Republican Party on how you talk about public education. <coughs> There are some who just say, oh, let's eliminate wholesale the Department of Education. And then there are some who say, well, let's make sure it's more efficient. Um, I think, and I was talking to actually Jeb Bush about this. We shared a stage in San Francisco. We both are in the same school of thought, which is let's make sure Title I money is used efficiently. Let's try to block grant more of that to the states, even though the money originates with the federal government. 
And then the other thing we can do is, and, and I'm actually on the same page with President Obama on race to the top. Uh, there's some, and there's some who disagree with that. Um, I don't think the federal government should be calling the shots on exactly what standards look like, but they can be encouraging states to make standards more rigorous. I mean, if there's anyone in this room who believes the states are really the leading entities in public education, it's, it, it has to be, I have to be in that group. I served on the State Board of Education, right? I, I'm very committed to that. But, but that's a way to make sure the federal government isn't trampling on states, but encouraging them to do what's right. Um, with respect to, um, you know, English language immersion, um, I'm a big proponent of English language immersion. I'll tell you why. I have to look at uh, my personal experience. My father was um, 11 years old in East Africa, didn't know English, didn't know it at all. Uh, started learning English. Five years later, he was in a medical school program in Ireland. Uh, he was put in a very rigorous English language immersion program, and he went from being, uh, you know, functionally not literate at all in English to being actually invited to Buckingham Palace to sit down with a queen who was, was uh, invited all the top students from East Africa to go, you know, <coughs> so she could encourage their educational pursuits. So I've seen it work wonders in my own family. This is not a political issue for me. Uh, and that's why I'm so committed to it. Um, a good friend of mine who's fought this fight is actually, uh, and you guys might vilify him now because he hiked your rates, but he founded Netflix, Reed Hastings, and uh, he fought this fight on English language immersion. He's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but we agree. Uh, knowing English is a passport to success in this economy. That doesn't mean you don't know other languages. I grew up appreciating multiple languages. Well, you know, when my, some of my grandparents get upset at me, they yell at me in a foreign language. That should tell you something. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you don't learn English, right? So we can agree there's no trade-off. And it's downright important to know English to participate in this economy. That's my point of view. Okay? All right. We have time for one more? I hope so. Yeah, we have, we have time for more. Okay, one more in the back. Um, everybody has their priorities and policies. Uh, how do you prioritize education and reducing the debt? Because I know in some circumstances, even if you get really efficient education system, you still might be faced with trade-offs. Where do you go? Well, listen, I, I, I think, let, let me talk about uh, few things first. I'm a big proponent of looking at what states have done effectively and seeing if we can emulate those practices at the federal government's level. Let me talk about two of them right now. Um, actually, three of them probably come to mind. The first is a balanced budget requirement. More than 40 states have a balanced budget requirement. The federal government doesn't, which is why you know the dollar might not be the reserve currency to the world you know, much longer because we're continuing to print money, which we can't do excessively. So I think a balanced budget requirement is important. Um, look at a, I look at a single subject rule as a way to combat federal waste. A single subject rule requires every bill in Congress to only apply to one topic. More than one, more than 40 states have this requirement. I think Congress should too. Otherwise you get an energy bill with an education component and then a tax policy attached at the end. That doesn't make sense. That's why people don't trust their politicians anymore because there's too much uh, log rolling that's happening. So um, in order to answer your question, I don't think there's much of a trade-off. I think in education, as with everything, we have to learn to do more with less. Uh, I'm a big believer in charter schools. I worked on the front lines of a charter school in, in the KIPP charter schools, actually, in, uh, in, in San Francisco. And I'll tell you, there was, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from making the dollar go further in the charter school movement. So, um, I don't think there's much of competition, but again, the federal government should not be the primary player in public education. I, I understand that. It's, I just feel like you're kind of dancing around it a little bit. Like, if you only had a certain amount of money, would you choose to increase education or lower the debt? Well, listen, I think we you're missing another option, which is to reprioritize spending. You, you seem to be gliding over that fact. So there's a lot that we need to there's a lot that we need to be targeting in the federal budget. Another one of my ideas, which many states have adopted, uh, is a sunset law. You know, um, there's there's often a joke that goes around, which is the old adage that the uh, the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a federal program. You know, and I tend to agree. The problem is you have all these programs that once they get passed, they stay there forever. And so, you know, we need to have a top-down review before we talk about um, we talk about this in unnecessarily dark terms. I'm a big believer in public education. 
Uh, in fact, that's the only reason why I had the opportunity to speak before you today. You know, my family invested in my education. And, um, I had public school teachers who cared about me, so I think it's very important. But there's other ways that needs to go first, and I would certainly be a defender of education. One more question. Yeah, last question. Back. I have a question about perspective. Do you feel that you, as the individual, embody your district and your choices that you make are represented of your district, or do you feel it's more important for you to pull and know what your district thinks, feels, believes about particular issues or topics? What's your approach? A couple of things. I'll, just in terms of my background, I'm born and raised here. Um, I, I think the one thing that distinguishes me from my opponent is that I'm the only one in the race who's uh, only called this community in his home. That's a big difference. You know, I'm not uh, packing a suitcase to run this race. So I, I do think I identify with a lot of the you know, kind of core values of this community, but I can guarantee you one thing. As your elected representative, I would maintain consistent outreach. One thing that happens to people is they go to Washington, D.C., they're put in a bubble. They start taking their marching orders from somewhere else. The special interests start calling the shots. That's a problem. One way to guard against that is to be out there, just like we are today, right? We're taking questions. Um, we're providing answers. That's a, that's a habit that I want to make a practice. Um, and so, I mean, I would only answer your question by saying I intend to fully be fully accessible. Cool. All right. I think I think we're gonna have to stop there. Is that right? uh, is it a quick question? Yeah, it's just a very quick question. Okay, so I was just wondering because you know, obviously, something that correlates a lot with high school dropouts is um, unplanned pregnancies and things of that matter. So I was just wondering, what is your opinion on abortion? Um, you know, I'm I'm personally uh, pro-life. Uh, what I would tell you is that there's federal policy on this for, and it's been in place since the 70s. Um, the federal government doesn't provide funding for this practice. Um, and so to that extent, it uh, remains a state crime. Okay. okay. All right. We're going to, Buck is in the back. I need you to have to do two things. If you're a registered voter here, sign our petition. It's a way to circumvent the filing fee. We need to get 3,000 signatures. Uh, if you want to volunteer and get involved, we would love your help. Okay, there's a lot of kinetic energy in this race, and you can give us more. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.